there's this line called I am monarch of all I survey. So in the beginning you have I am monarch of all I survey. So see that is anapestic. Hello and welcome back to Nibble Pop. This video is going to be on a topic for which we have got so many requests. We are going to look at prosody and scansion. We will discuss everything possible on different kinds of feet, meter and how poems are scanned. I don't want you to miss anything in this video because this portion is extremely scoring for your exams. And along with giving you every kind of theoretical perspective on the different kinds of feet and meter, I will also be sharing with you some very special tips and techniques which helped me in my college days to understand and remember complex terms associated with scansion. So if you like this video, then do consider subscribing to us so that you can stay in touch with us. This is Monami Mukherjee. Welcome once again. What is scansion? Scanning involves looking minutely at parts or components of something. For example, when we go for a scan of our full body, then all our organs are displayed there for scrutiny. So when you are asked to scan any poetic piece, it means you have to look at the components of that poem. Now, what do I mean by components? When you break down a poem into its components, means parts, you don't look at the meaning of the poem. You look at the structure, the sound, the effect that the poem has when you recite it. So scansion, prosody, this essentially deals with the sound effect of poetry. I'm saying poetry, although in many cases we see that rules of scansion or prosody applies to prose as well. But for convenience's sake, we will take it for granted that we will be dealing with only poetry when it comes to scansion. Formally speaking, scansion means dividing a verse or a line of poem into feet or measures to show its rhythm or meter. And what is rhythm? Rhythm is a regular pattern which you find when you read out any poem. Now in order to understand this whole idea, first let me talk about the idea of syllables. What are syllables? Syllable means that part of a word which you can pronounce at one go. For example, when you pronounce the word cat, you do it at one go. This means that the word cat has only one syllable. But what if you say caterpillar? If you look at the word or if you think about the word as you speak it out, how are you saying this? Caterpillar. So you are breaking that word into four separate parts, each of which you can speak out at one go. So while cat, which is a comparatively bigger animal, has one syllable, caterpillar has four syllables. Now I hope you're getting the point. So I'm going to give you a very quick tip to understand how many syllables can there be in a word. See, whenever you look at a word, first try to identify the vowels. You know what vowels are, A, E, I, O, U. And when Y is used at the end, it's also a semi-vowel. So you know about all that. So first, identify the vowels. Sometimes you will see that two or more vowels are there together, clubbed together, and they are pronounced together. For example, in the word about, okay. So you're pronouncing a separately, but the two vowels O and U, they are pronounced together. 
with the sound like ow about okay so here you have two vowel portions or two vowel units we can say one is a and one is the unit which has the two vowels o u that are pronounced together so in this word about or in a word around the same thing is happening here you have three vowels but you have two vowel units therefore this word has two syllables so how can you say how many syllables are there in a word you will say that the number of vowel units are equal to the number of syllables but be careful if there is any vowel which is not pronounced and it's silent you can say or you cannot pronounce it uh, with any prominence for example there are often words which end in e where you don't pronounce that e in that case that e is irrelevant for example in the word bite b i t e you don't pronounce it as by t if you had pronounced it as by t then two syllables would have been there but since you are saying bite it means that yes that e is affecting the pronunciation but you are only pronouncing one vowel unit that is i as if it is b then i then t okay therefore the word b i t e although it has two vowels it has only one syllable so with more practice you will be able to uh, quickly uh, underline all the syllables so the first thing when you are asked to scan any poetic piece is to underline each and every syllable with a pencil this is an absolute must you must do this even if you are feeling confident that you can uh, actually visualize the whole thing i insist on you to underline the syllables use a pencil you can rub it off later on so that's the first step that you are going to do now depending on the number of syllables a word can be disyllabic if it has two syllables it can be monosyllabic if it has one syllable it can be trisyllabic it can be tetrasyllabic pentasyllabic oh, well it goes on like that as a part of exercise uh, you can uh, break up five words which i'm giving right now i'm going to give them on screen uh, let's see umbrella unified ambitious aside q pause this video pause it right now because i'm going to give you the answer right after this i want you to do them on your own and then check if you are correct or not okay all right so you have done it now in umbrella um bre la three syllables are there in you ni fight this is a very interesting thing you have a single vowel in the beginning which is u it's a separate syllable then you have n i ni and then fight it has two vowels but the sound is one unit so that is also one syllable so you have three syllables in you ni fight so it is a trisyllabic word then you have let's see what did i say ambitious m b s h a s c t i o u s it has three vowels i o u doesn't matter you are pronouncing it as s h a s so it's only one syllable so m b s h a s is also trisyllabic the next word which i had given is aside in aside a is pronounced but e is not pronounced i is pronounced okay so we can say that it has two syllables a sight okay and the last one which i had said is a very long word because it is q q u e u e so many vowels doesn't really matter it is only one syllable because no matter how many vowels you q up in q it will only give you one single unit of pronunciation so q has one syllable so i hope now you are very confident about how to break words into syllables i'll come to the next part and now you'll understand why this is very important why breaking up words into syllables is the first thing that you do second thing is whenever there is a word which you have broken up into syllables 
if it has more than one syllable then we do not pronounce both the syllables with equal force for example uh, taking a word from our previous uh, set of words umbrella when you say umbrella you don't say umbrella all together with the same force you try to give force on one syllable and on the other syllables you uh, you speak with less force so whenever you are giving more force on any one syllable it is called an accent or stress okay normally in english uh, there are certain rules when you put these stress uh, marks on the words i'm going to share with you some of the tips which might come very useful when you are thinking about where to put stress in a word when you're going to pronounce it the english people they try to stress the words uh, in the very beginning as much as possible in the first or second syllable itself okay unless it is exceptional all right so first rule is if it is a normal word normal means without any prefix or suffix if it's a normal word with one syllable well then you just stress it and if it is a trisyllabic word then usually the tendency of native english speakers is to put stress on the first syllable okay in words where we have two to three syllables there is only one stress that is usually given like you don't stress a three syllable word uh, stressing all the syllables or uh, two syllables that sounds awkward notice the word awkward when i said the word awkward it has two syllables i stressed on the part awk and i said the word word with less force because it's a disyllabic word the tendency is to put stress on the first part that is awk and then i do not give stress on the next part because that will not sound good so the first rule is try to put stress on the first syllable of the word second rule is do not give stress on more than one syllables if it is a disyllabic or trisyllabic word okay this is the general rule now there are exceptions i'll come to that most of the words which you will come across are disyllabic okay they have two syllables if it is a noun pay attention if it is a noun then always stress on the first syllable if it is a verb stress on the second syllable i'll give you some examples so the word college co ledge so you have two syllables it's a noun so you must stress co and ledge will be unstressed or unaccented another example is music okay when you say the word music you stress on mu because music is a noun now when the same thing happens like disyllabic words are there but they are verbs what do you do then take for example the word confirm advise prevent everywhere you stress the second syllable now let me give you a very interesting word a word where the noun and the verb forms are same contrast when i use it as a noun i say a sentence like uh, macbeth and banco are uh, are great contrast to each other and when i use it as a verb i say that one set of events contrast the other set of events when we are using it as noun we are saying contrast and when we are using it as verb we say contrasts so depending on the accent we understand if it is a noun or a verb if you know about any such word which can be used both as a noun and a verb and they have two syllables write them down in the comment section 
and try to see where you are putting the stress and when. Now, suppose a word has two syllables but the first syllable is a prefix. What is prefix? Prefix is like uh, an addition which you add to a word in the beginning of the word. Look at the word prefix. It itself has a prefix. The word pre, it means something which comes before. Fix is the real word here. You are adding pre to make it prefix. Examples of prefix? Unfaithful unwise, preserve, inactive, enslave. Whenever you are adding prefixes, the root word has to be accented. Root word means the word which actually gives meaning to the whole thing. Okay. So, although we give stress on the first syllable under normal circumstances, if the word has a prefix, then the first syllable is the prefix. We do not stress the first part if that word has a prefix. We stress the root word. Similarly, if a word has a suffix, suffix means which comes at the end, beautiful. So there we do not accent full, we say beautiful. Okay, see it has three syllables. We are accenting the first syllable and the second and third go unaccented. So prefix, suffix, these are never accented uh, under normal circumstances. Another very important thing you have to remember, another tip is do not ever put stress on articles. Articles means a and the. Do not do that. All right. It doesn't sound good. You do not accent those. Prepositions, conjunctions and interjections may be accented. Uh, in order to give some emphasis if that poem or if that line uh, is focusing on that word or if you think that it is creating a good pattern of meter then of course you can accent a preposition but usually uh, we do not accent these minor words we accent the focus words the important words so after breaking the line into syllables the next job is to put accent marks. Where do you put the mark? Accent mark is you put a straight line on top of the vowel or the vowel unit of that syllable which is accented. And if it is unaccented, uh, you can just leave it unmarked or uh, what I used to do is I used to give a horizontal line just to show that it is not accented. So that creates a pattern like this. Now after you do this to a line, then comes the idea of meter. Why are we doing this? Why are we breaking it up? We are breaking it up to identify a pattern. How will you look at the pattern? How will you identify the pattern? You will have to Stop looking at the meaning of the line. You have broken down the line into syllables. You have put the accent marks. And now you will be looking at the recurrence of pattern. It's like mathematics. I will come to different kinds of patterns which you can find. There are not many. Easily identifiable patterns are there. And when you identify these patterns who are regularly repeating, that will give you the beat of the poem, the meter of the poem. On screen, I'm giving you an example of a line. Look at how the syllables are broken down. Look at how the accent marks are placed and a pattern is established based on which I have put some stroke marks to separate the different units of the line. So you're getting some separate units each unit has one accented syllable okay this unit of two or more syllables which has one accent mark this unit is called one foot the plural of foot feet under exceptional situations a foot may contain one syllable which is accented we will come to that 
but normally it contains two or three syllables out of which only one is accented. You never have more than one accented syllable in a foot. So look at the accent signs. How many accent signs are there? So ideally speaking, you will have that many number of feet. You have four accent marks in this line, you have four feet. You have five accent lines in this line, you will have five feet. Now around these accent marks, there can be unaccented double syllables, unaccented single syllables, doesn't matter. Count the number of accent lines and you will understand how many feet are there. A foot can be disyllabic, a foot can be trisyllabic and only under one circumstance a foot can be monosyllabic. Again that is so much exceptional we will come to it at the end. So let's look at the normal situations. You have two syllables in a foot that is a disyllabic foot. You have three syllables it is a trisyllabic foot. Okay. Now we will first know about the four kinds of disyllabic foot because they are the most common when a poem is written. And then we will talk about three trisyllabic feet which we come across sometimes as exceptions, sometimes as variations and sometimes as a regular meter of a poem. Okay. The disyllabic feet are iambic, trochaic, spondic and pyrrhic. So these are the four kinds of feet which you come across as disyllabic feet. Among the trisyllabic feet we have anapest, amphibrach and dactylic. All right. Now these are complicated words aren't they? How are you to remember which is what? Suppose a foot has one accented syllable and one unaccented syllable. How to remember which of these uh, correspond to that foot? How to remember the names and connect them to the pattern of the foot? This is something which I am going to share with you. Now this is just a very casual tip uh, and this helped me in my college days and somehow my students have also benefited from it. So why not share it with you? See, when you look at the words, I am big, trochaic, try to break them into syllables first. Then try to put stress in these words. How would you break down the word I am big? When you pronounce I am big, then you are giving more force to big than I am. I am is a very soft kind of a syllable right this is what I feel so when you break the word ambic you are doing what you're putting one unstressed syllable and then a stressed syllable so whenever in poetry you have a foot where you see one unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable it is called an iambic foot now let me give you some examples. There is a poem called um, Emily Dickinson's I Cannot Live With You. I have uh, made a video on that poem too. Let me take a line from there. I cannot live with you. It would be life. And life is over there behind the shelf. Now we will break this part uh, the way I have taught you. Okay. Let me first break the syllables. I can not live with you all monosyllables okay it would be life and life is over there this is the first time when you're having a break here over two syllables otherwise till now all of the words are monosyllabic last line behind two syllables the shelf now after you have broken this into syllables you can see that you have one unaccent, then accent, then unaccent, then accent, then unaccent, then accent. Okay, you're getting a pattern here. So if we just put strokes after I can, then after live, then you are breaking the line into regularly recurring patterns, right? Each of which is giving you something like an unstressed syllable and then a stressed syllable. 
Now, this is an ideal situation. Normally, in poetry, you will have uh, mix-ups, okay, where in between there are uh, feet which do not look like the other feet around. Okay, that is okay. That is variation. You can have one disturbingly different foot, whereas the majority of feet in the passage is one kind of foot, then you say that this is predominantly that kind of foot. For example, here it is predominantly iambic. Is there any variation? No, there is no variation. All uh, the feet in this uh, four lines, all of them are iambic. How many feet are there in the first line? Three feet. I can not live with you. So three feet. Second line, it would be life. Two feet. So the first line is iambic trimeter. Meter is uh, this pattern. How many times uh, are these patterns repeated? That is the meter of that line. So the first line is iambic trimeter. The second line is iambic diameter. Die is two. Again, the third line is iambic trimeter and the fourth line is iambic diameter. Now, there is a very interesting thing about iambics. What is special about iambic feet? When you listen to your heartbeat, preferably through a stethoscope, the sound which you get is lubdub. So, your heart is beating like iambic meter. And therefore, somehow I feel when you read aloud any iambic poem, it is very comfortable to read because it follows the rhythm of your heart and it is usually used to write love sonnets, no doubt. And when it is not rhymed and there are five feet in iambic lines, that is called blank verse. Okay, so unrhymed iambic pentameter is blank verse. If you are going to appear for uh, net set or uh, school service commission exams, uh, try to remember these things, okay, that unrhymed iambic pentameter is called a blank verse. Where have you studied blank verse till now? You have done it in Milton's Paradise Lost, you have done it in William Shakespeare's place such as Macbeth. Normally, iambic is used to write emotional verse and uh, is somehow very common uh, with English people. Coming to the next one is trochaic. Again, if you look at the word trochaic and you break it up into two syllables, you get the first syllable accented and the second syllable is unaccented. Just like that, here you have any line where the foot has the first syllable accented and the second one unaccented. Let me show you an example. Uh, let's look at these very famous lines. Double, double, toil and trouble. Fire, burn and cauldron, bubble. Scale of dragon, tooth of wolf. Which is mummy, maw and gulf. If you break the first line, double, double, toil and trouble, you will see that you are putting stress on the first syllable and putting the second syllable without stress. So this is called a trochaic feat. It's called a trochee. In the second line, something very interesting is happening. After you break the whole part into syllables and put the accent marks, you will notice that the first line is fine, unstress, sorry, stress, unstress, stress, unstress, stress, unstress, stress, unstress. But the next line is fire. So what is this? Is this disyllabic, monosyllabic? Doesn't matter because even if it is monosyllabic, you still put an accent there, fire, okay? Burn and cauldron bubble. That is fine. Come to the last line. Witches, mummy, maw and gulf. 
Gulf is of course accented but it is all alone. There is no unaccented uh, uh, syllable after gulf. In the previous line too, there is no unaccented syllable after wolf. Earlier you had, uh, in case of trouble and then bubble, you had the BLE unaccented. But there is nothing like that in the last two lines. So they are all alone. This happens in trochaic all the time. In trochaic meter, you start from the beginning and you see that at the end of the line you have one hanging accented single syllable. This is called a catalytic feat. Okay, so catalytic is very much a part of trochaic feat. It happens in many of the trochaic lines you will come across. Trochaic is usually uh, used for writing uh, poems of despair, uh, poems which do not come naturally as natural human emotions. Okay, in war poems you use that. There's a lot of drum beat in trochaic. Okay, okay, so it's like dum di dum di dum di dum. So you are uh, putting a lot of force there. The lines which I have used here as an example, can you identify the lines? They are from Macbeth. They are spoken by the witches, are natural agents. So imagine the beauty of Macbeth. While Shakespeare is using unrhymed iambic pentameter for the entire course of the play, where human beings are speaking in uh, these unrhymed iambic pentameter lines, he is using trochaic meter to give you the dialogue of the witches because that has to be a different kind of a speech. So this is how you mix and match different meters, different sound effects to uh, provide difference, to provide uh, some focus to some incident. Okay, so this is what uh, Macbeth is about. It's about this uh, difference of lifestyle between the human beings and the witches and so on. Next one is very interesting. Spondy. If you look at the word, you want to put stress on both the syllables. Both are very strong syllables. I had earlier told you that a foot can have only one accented syllable. This is a real exception. It occurs rarely. You don't write a poem uh, using all the feet in spondy. It's like you have to then accent all the syllables because spondy is about accenting both the syllables of a disyllabic feet. Therefore, what you do is you put in a spondy in a line which is otherwise iambic, otherwise trochaic. Why? If the two words or the two syllables are both very important. Suppose you are using the words, you know, dark despair. So then you are, you, you are going to put force on both the words or usually this happens with repetitions like dark dark then you want to give stress on both the words so spondic is um, a rather less used foot but it adds a lot of emphasis or puts a focus on any set of words where both the syllables demand equal force of pronunciation Pirhik, imagine this word, how would you pronounce it? Can you ever stress anything in the word Pirhik? Uh, if you pronounce Pir and then Rik, well, it has to be a soft sound all around. So a foot where nothing is accented is a Pirhik. So it's like a weak man uh, without any force left. So that is a Pirhik. Now, it's just the opposite of Spondic, okay? Pyrrhic is used uh, quite a lot of times whenever you have two prepositions together or maybe a preposition which is a minor preposition and then an article. For example, if you say in a, in a, then you don't accent either. Therefore, when you have units or foot where uh, you don't have anything accented, you call it a pyrrhic. Now, since these are uh, variations. You don't have a poem entirely written in Pyrrhic. So I'm not giving you an example of Pyrrhic as yet. You can identify these uh, variations 
in poems written in iambic trochaic or any kind of standard meter now let's come to the trisyllabic feat the first one is anapest see anapest so you are giving no accent no accent and then accent so that is the structure of an anapest anapest is more like an extension of iambic how is iambic unstress stress so instead of saying unstress stress you are giving it one more unstress in the beginning so it's a more flowy kind of a foot where you have a more uh, swing in the rhythm to make things clear let me give you an example okay let's see let's look at this poem it was the night before christmas when all through the house not a creature was stirring not even a mouse see uh, it's it's so flowy and rhythmy and you have all the time in the world kind of an effect so that is an anapestic poem uh, usually you don't have whole poems written in anapestic uh, feet uh, there's a very beautiful poem by cowper uh, it's called the solitude of alexander selkirk there you also have a lot of anapestic feet there's this line called i am monarch of all i survey so in the beginning you have i am mo monarch of all i survey so see that is anapestic so anapesty gives you a very a beautiful flow again following the natural rhythm of iambic and usually in many iambic poems you have some feet or foot in between you know which are anapestic sometimes it can happen that the line is in iambic but there is a place where you have two uh, minor words or syllables as i was telling you in a i saw a girl in a shade so i saw a girl are iambic but then you are saying in a shade this is anapestic anapestic comes naturally with iambic just like that there is the next foot which we are going to talk about which comes naturally with trochaic how how is trochaic trochaic is stress and stress so if you just add one more on stress you get dactylic again you break that word you get this structure stress and stress and stress dactylic okay so dactylic is a very beautiful um, kind of a meter uh, it is you can say the opposite of anapest okay so instead of going like this it comes like that so it comes down and uh, just a trivia uh, it is also called the heroic hexameter when you use dactylic in a hexameter line okay it's heroic hexameter it was used in iliad odyssey all kind of great poems uh, virgil's aeneid now let me give you a very famous example from tennyson the charge of the light brigade when you read that poem take for example these lines cannon to right of them cannon to left of them cannon in front of them volleyed and thundered you can notice that drum beat the drum beat which goes with trochi right but instead of putting the drum beat as a two syllable drum you are having it as a three syllable drum except yes you have noticed correctly in the last line thundered you're having what kind of a foot it's a trochaic foot now because dactylic and trochaic are so intimately uh, connected it like brothers uh, so it's very natural to our ear when you put in a trochaic foot in a dactylic poem or a dactylic foot in a trochaic poem but if you put a dactylic foot in an iambic poem it is a disaster it never happens don't do that ever so when you have an iambic foot try to keep it uh, along the lines of anapest and pyrrhic uh, and in trochaic you can go for spondic you can go for dactylic okay so these are the family families of feet we can say who are compatible with each other the third 
trisyllabic food which we are going to talk about is amphibrac how i used to remember what amphibrac is is very weird but i will share that with you do you know what an amphibian looks like it's a frog okay so an amphibian lives in both water and land amphi means both brac means small something which is short amphibrac means an accent which has two short accents on both sides now that looks like a frog to me if it looks like a frog to you then you will be also able to remember amphibian equals to amphibrac and it looks like a frog with the head as the accent and the legs as the unaccent okay so try to remember it that way amphibracs are very unusual if you are using it for the whole poem comparatively anapest dactylic these are okay if you are using it for the whole poem but amphibrac for the whole poem is usually uh, not found uh, but i have found an example for you the figure was walking between us we both saw it stumble it fell then a crowd gathered round and soon started to mumble so it doesn't sound very rhythmic but it has a very peculiar kind of a sequence going on okay so i'm breaking it up for you for your convenience uh, normally amphibrachic uh, foot they are also seen as variations within a normally iambic uh, foot or where you have the need to just put in one more syllable to make things regular now take for example this line we look before and after and pine for what is not okay just take this part we look before and after this looks like an iambic foot we look before and after now what is bothering us is this t e r in the word after what to do with it now if you include it in the foot that comes at the end of the line then this is what is called a an amphibrachic foot okay you are free to do one more thing turn it into an iambic throw that t e r outside so that t e r an accented part of after that is hanging out without any accent all alone and this line is called hypermetrical so when you have unaccented foot at the end of a line hanging alone then it is not a foot this is line is hypermetrical and here we have how many feet we look one foot before second foot and af third foot tur no foot so it's iambic trimeter hypermetrical line all right if you wish you can turn the last foot into an amphibrach right so now you realize it doesn't really matter whether you are calling something um, an amphibrach or you breaking it to call it hypermetrical what matters is whatever you are doing in your scanning should be written accordingly so if you scan it as hypermetrical do not write amphibrachic if you are scanning it as amphibrachic do not write hypermetrical whatever you are doing there scanning in a way write exactly what you are doing and the predominant meter should be identified that this poem is predominantly iambic all right so identification of the predominant meter will fetch you uh, almost half the mark right away so if it is a five mark question you will get one mark for identification of meter uh, again another mark for uh, scanning up the passage and then of course uh, another couple of marks for the different kind of variations that you will identify so it is very easy to score uh, five on five for prosody or scansion come to the next special foot or feet um what if that last part is not unaccented but accented what if the hanging solo syllable at the end of a line is 
accented is called catalytic again unlike hypermetrical you can't put a catalytic foot inside the previous foot why because in a foot you cannot have two accented syllables if it is a three syllable foot okay therefore you have to just apply your mathematical uh, skills to adjust the strokes the breakups to make it regular i can't do it for you not for all the poems that will come across with more practice you will get the skills acquired but yes you have to start with some knowledge which is this that i have to establish a regular pattern and i have to write down whatever i have established that is very important third special case is when you have one lonely accented foot in the beginning of a line so catalytic is at the end of the line now one more thing is in hypermetrical you don't count that part which contains the single unaccented syllable but in catalytic you count that because whenever you are giving a stress you have to count that as a foot what if this happens in the beginning of the word take for example the line sleep will come when thou art fled you want to put stress on the word sleep and you can say that this is a trochaic line sleep will come when thou art fled so you have 1 2 3 and 4 four feet the last is catalytic right this is correct absolutely correct again you have the option of doing something else what else instead of putting fled alone you can turn this into an iambic line how put sleep alone and then read the line will come when thou art fled so how to understand whether to make it a catalytic line or an acephalous line this is called an acephalous line why because when you are putting the the uh, word sleep alone in the beginning what you are doing is you are creating a headless iambic what is the head of the iambic the an accent okay so you are cutting off the head so it is acephalous cephalo means head so it's a headless foot sleep you will understand by looking at the rest of the poem is the whole poem in trochaic meter then turn it into a catalytic because then the rhythm will be maintained okay sleep will come when thou art fled maybe the whole poem is in trochaic meter so this pattern will maintain but if the poem is a very sweet i am big verse then you don't suddenly barge in with those drum beats of war you continue with that soft melody and is talking about sleep come on and how do you say it then sleep will come when thou art fled that gives you the right tone so look at the entire poem prosody exists in whole meter exists in whole although we are looking at the parts the parts should match the whole okay so yes a line can be both acephalous and catalytic whenever you have an acephalous line you have iambic line whenever you have a catalytic line you have a trochaic line but it depends on the nature of the poem itself if this line is given to you on its own you are free to do whatever you want now before i wrap up today's class uh, let me give you a little bit of information about different kinds of special meters that are used by poets one i have already told you blank verse it's unrhymed iambic pentameter instead of pentameter if you are using tetrameter that is 4 feet in a line it's iambic and it is rhymed that is called a romantic meter okay another very important or interesting uh, structure is iambic hexameter and that is called an alexandrine so again these will be very handy if you are going to sit for any competitive exams so 
I hope you have got some grasp over uh, what are the different kinds of feet, how to identify the feet, what are the special qualities, what are the different kinds of poems that are associated with each. It is difficult, you know, through these lectures to actually give you a hands-on experience of scansion itself. But maybe in future videos we can uh, take up, maybe in live sessions if possible, uh, some actual scanning which we will do together. Uh, just remember that at the end of it, uh, whenever you scan any poem, uh, first break down the syllables and then divide them up into proportionate pieces, look at the pieces, identify the foot, identify the dominant meter, identify the variations and write what you have done in the scansion. So don't scan it up and then look at your uh, friend's uh, scripts and copy whatever that person is doing because maybe the scansion uh, the process that your friend has done is a different one. So stick to what you have done your scan report should match with your scan process. If possible, I'll try to post in some exercises, some solved exercises as PDF with this video. I hope you have enjoyed today's class. If you have any questions related to this topic or any other topic that you want me to cover, do comment in the section for comments. Okay, so till our next video, Stay happy, stay subscribed. This is Mona Mukherjee signing off.